Hello listeners, watchers and subscribers. Welcome to another chapter in the SDR Disco Call show and today we have a special episode, something a little different off the beaten track. Uh, and before I introduce you to this guest, I wanted to give the story as to how this came about. So I've got a really good friend called Max Amies. He's one of the account executives that I used to work with in a company called Showpad, and we're best of buds. Uh, and I also knew that Max had a military career prior to getting into sales, and we've stayed really t close friends over the years. And me and Max were chatting the other day whilst he was in Singapore. I said, Neil, there's a guy that you really need to speak to. And uh, he's a guy of my own heart, and um, he's doing a lot of great things for the tech industry, but also for people such as myself that had worked in the military before. Um, so I just wanted to uh, hand over the mic, and I'd allow our guest to introduce yourself. Who are you, sir? Hello, uh, my name is Ben Reed, and I am the founder of Redeployable. Thank you for coming on the show, Ben, and an absolute privilege to have you on the show, sir. So, Ben, could you tell us, like, uh, where are you based in the world, and with Redeployable, what do you guys do? Of course, um, so my accent isn't telling. I'm originally from the northwest of England, but I live in a little village in Hampshire called Hartley Whitney. Um, I had a career in, in sales as well as the military, and then I founded a company called Redeployable, which helps people from the military transition into technology sales. Love it, sir. Thank you very much. And as for all our listeners, watchers and subscribers, with all of our guests, we'll be putting their links to their LinkedIn profile and for Redeployable, if you'd like to learn more, by visiting the comment section below in the notes. Uh, and as a gentle reminder, if you're listening to this on your local podcast platform, please make sure that you give us a rating and subscribe and click the bell notification for each time a new episode comes out. And if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, make sure that you give us a comment, like, and subscribe. And if you have any thoughts or questions, then drop them in the comment section below. So Ben, uh, based out in the north of the UK, uh, outside of sales, what are kind of your passions and hobbies and interests? What floats your boat, sir? So let's probably talk around before I, I had a startup. So I was, I'm a big fan, a big fan of golf. I'm a big fan of football. Uh, I play quite a bit of both. I, I like to do exercise, you know, I like to go running. I've done a couple of ultras. Um, but, then, but then I, you know, founded a business. <laughs> and, uh, and some of these <laughs> hobbies have kind of dwindled alongside a new baby. So but they're, they're what Aww. I generally like. Congratulations, sir. And yeah, um, when, when you get into fatherhood, some things do take a bit of a back burner. Uh, I've really worked tirelessly in the last years to try and get back on some of my hobbies, but I can totally understand that one, sir. So for a lot of us um, that are used to this show, what you know at this point is that we like to do a bit of screen sharing. And what we want to do is visit this lovely guest's LinkedIn profile. And a reminder that links to Ben's LinkedIn profile will be in the show notes below. But also before we just dive into this, because Ben is somebody that I've recently noted posting a lot of great content on my LinkedIn feed, um, especially for those working, well, ex-military and looking to get into tech sales. And he has his own views and opinions on this. But the guy also runs his own sales podcast. So make sure that you check out Sales Veterans, the podcast, and you can view the link here and I'll put them in the show notes below. Uh, but Ben, with yourself coming back to your career, you've had quite an extensive career, sir, before finding up your own company. Uh, but as we can see here, uh, you worked for the British Army. Uh, you'd been a Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineer and had various roles over 10 years. Uh, you then transitioned into the world of tech. Uh, you came to Rico. Uh, you then for an account executive for Descartes Systems Group, which then had an offshoot with Descartes PeopleVox. Uh, you'd also been head of sales for Supply Compass. And most recently in the last seven months, you've been a founder for your own startup called Redeployable. So could you walk us through, Ben, in your own words, like how did things start off when you was a young wee Ben and to get into launching your own company? How did that happen? Yeah, of course. Um, so my original plan was to go to university. So I, I started, uh, you know, finished my GCSEs, went, went to sixth form, started uh, my A-levels and then decided that I was far too immature uh, and and <laughs> did, didn't want to carry on the the, the whole higher education piece. Uh, luckily for me, um, I had an older sister who did something similar, and also an older brother who both, you know, shipped off and, and went and joined the army at an early age. So oh. I followed their lead uh, and uh, joined the army at sixteen. Wow. 
And do you know what, like, um, truth be told, when I was younger, I had a problem, as some of the guests and listeners know, that I had a problem with education and authority. Uh, and I was always thought to myself, and I used to be in the cadets when I was younger, I was in the RF, uh, RAF cadets, and I always thought, do you know what, if things don't work out at home because I was a bit of a troublemaker, maybe joining the army might be something to do. Or it was also threatened to be by my parents that if you don't fix up, Neil, we're going to, you know, you're going to have to go join the army and get out of home. For young people, like, looking to join something like the army, what sort of things do they have to think about? Or, you know, why could it be something good for them, do you think? Yeah, I mean, great question. You see, I don't think you... I, I think, like, from a starting point, joining, joining the forces, it's like a life decision, isn't it? You're going to be moving away from home. Mm. You're going to be travelling a lot. And you're going to have to deal with a certain level of authority. You know, when we started at, mm. at the Army Foundation College in in what 2006 which makes me feel really old i think we started with 55 <laughs> people in our platoon and we finished with 17 yeah. so there are a lot of people who you know over a 52 week period weren't really cut out for it and that and that's okay but i think if you if you're looking to start in the military i wouldn't take it lightly i think it's a great career mm. especially if you want to build some discipline some structure you know some work ethic around your life i i, I think it's a it's second to none for that Thank you very much for the two cents there. And, um, you know, I've never actually had somebody on the show that has been in the military before or had any insight into that sort of life, like speaking with Max at length. We spoke a couple of things when he went out on tours and stuff, but I'd love to know, you know, that decade that you worked um, within that field, what was it like and what are the different type of roles that you're doing and what are the different things that you sort of learned, Ben? Yeah, so... When you say veteran, I mean, veteran makes us all sound a little bit old, but you know, you've got young <laughs> veterans and older veterans and, and I acknowledge that, um, across the veteran sphere, you have many different trades. So it's not all, you know, hunt, hunt and kill operationally. You're in, you're in firefights. You've got many, many different trades within, within the military. So, I mean, from my perspective, I was an aircraft engineer. That was my route in something called the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. So I basically f fixed fixed wing and rotary aircraft, so helicopters and planes. Mm. Um, and yeah, held a, held a number of different roles, starting from a junior like entry level, you know, a BDR equivalent, if you will, and worked my way up to, <laughs> you know, a, a, a sales manager type role, but fixing, you know, fixing and looking after a group of people uh, on aircraft. Well, you must have seen a lot of cool things and like different places and going there as well. And another thing that I wanted to understand was, so obviously like working within that field, you know, like you said, not everybody's going to be doing like killing, shooting, like fighting wars, etc. but you may be doing other things and operations. Um, but obviously a big element that I've, I'm a big advocate on is mental health. So I've known through friends that have been in the military where, you know, you may have experienced traumas or you may have seen things and, you know, sometimes you have to be able to rationalize these things and then it can affect you later in life. And sometimes I've found that people have moved away from working in these sort of fields to then go into something new with people that may be listening to the show and listening to somebody that's been within that sort of field and wanting to get into sales, but they're also worried about things that have happened in their past or stuff like that. How do people that deal with, you know, these life changing things with their mind, how do they process these things? How are they able to, you know, remove that fear of coming into a different light, starting a new and, but having that sort of like, you know, I wouldn't say chip on their shoulder, but how do I best put this? You know, deal with, like, I'll give you an example. I'm not going to name their name, but I knew somebody that had worked in sales and had been in the military, and there was a lot of traumas, which then came later back into their life whilst they're working in sales in stressful situations. What advice would you give to those people that may be going through those things, Ben? That's, I think, what I'm trying to ask. Yeah, I mean, that is that is a deep question, Neil. I, the, <laughs> I, can't, I can't speak firsthand because I haven't, I wasn't in situations like that when I was in the military. You know, I, I wasn't, mm. I went to Afghanistan, but I wasn't on the front line. And I know that, and I know of a lot of people uh, within my network who have been through a, a number of things whilst out there, some pretty horrendous things. There are a lot of, there are a lot of mm. support, uh, charities, organizations that help people along, along the way with this type of thing. Um, 
I'd say, you know, go and speak to people. I, I mean, you look, look in the, the US is a great example. They, they've got, they really do have a kind of therapist type culture, right? They all, they'll all go and speak to people and just let everything out and air everything, everything out. So, I mean, I, I am not an expert in, in, you know, PTSD, mental health, but I think talking around any problem and, you know, any challenge you have, speaking to someone either within your network or someone who's a professional and, and is able to kind of, uh, you know, really understand and listen to what, what your problems are and try and help you get through it. I, I think that's personally the best, the best bet. But like I said, I'm most definitely not a PTSD mental health expert. Yeah. No, I appreciate and respect that. So thank you very much. So like after this, um, we can look at your LinkedIn profile, like having a decade working within the military and then transitioning into a completely different place where you was with Rico as an account manager. What took you from working at military to then going into that sort of space and what was going through your mind at that point in time? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I've been a sheep the whole of my career, right? Like I, I joined the military because <laughs> my brother and my sister were in the military really. And when I was transitioning out or when I was thinking about leaving the military, I did just shy of 12 years. Um, I looked at mm. what my brother was doing, you know, my brother you know, at the time he didn't have any GCCs, joined the Royal Artillery, didn't serve too long, like six years. He got out and got into telesales, like hardcore, you know, phone, phone, Dialing phone, smiling. sales, sales, sell. And then gradually progressed <laughs> yeah. up to being an AE, senior AE uh, in SAS. You know, so he, he always, he always told me to get into tech, get into tech, get into tech. But I actually didn't know what that meant, you know, coming in, he talked about, e I remember a mm. conversation he had around e-commerce. I had no clue what e-commerce was really like when you were talking, you know, the software and tech within e-commerce, mm. but I always had my brother on my shoulder to kind of saying, you know, look at this, look at this, look at this. So the time came, uh, when I, you know, I was getting a bit frustrated. It was my time my, coming towards the end of my time, I think in the military. And I was at a party with a friend who was a teacher mm. and she just transitioned okay. out from being a sixth form PE teacher to being an account manager at Rico. So she said, ah. ah, yeah, completely just at a party. I think you'd really be really good in sales. Yeah. And, and that was my trigger. I got a, I got a, a meeting with her sales manager and, uh, and the, the rest is history really. Oh, I love that. I love that. Do you know what? It's, uh, I, I, I don't ever think it's out of pure luck. I always think that things happen for a reason. So you were supposed to be at that party. You were supposed to have that conversation and then it opened the door by having an introduction to her sales manager and her saying that I think you'd be good at sales. And then, you know, uh, as I read here on your LinkedIn, it says, luckily it paid off as I quickly found that many of the skills that I'd learned in the military gave me an advantage in the tech sales world. So could I ask what kind of skills did you learn from military that you think aided you like getting into tech sales, Ben? Yeah, so many, so many things now looking back <laughs> that, I mean, you know, starting the business in, in April this year and is giving me time just stepping away from technology sales to really like knuckle down on the business has given me time to think about these types of things and past scenarios and the things that might have contributed to, you know, relative success in, in tech sales. Um, just generally work ethic, I think is one and taking responsibility for your, your, your own work. You know, there, there isn't really any hiding mm. in the military. I mean, there, there are outliers and people who do, but generally, if you want to be a good, uh, a good member, a team, team player in the military, you need to think about others. You need to, you need to learn how to work cross-functionally. So, you know, we were the Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers. We're supported by the logistics. We work with the infantry, you know, all sorts of different units and different people. You're all coming together. And yeah. I really, I really do think that relates so so much into like software sales you've got bdrs working with AEs. you've got pre-sales working with age you've, you've got a product team who's supporting the, the organization you need to hand over to customer su success in the right way you, all these yeah. types of scenarios i think really match up um and then just some of these buzzwords you know i, I hear these buzzwords fired around the, the industry all the time you know resilience empathy you know, curious, yeah. good communicators. Yeah. I mean, let's talk just specifically about one person that I'm working with, right? He's a submariner. So the role of a submariner mm. is something I couldn't do personally. Uh, you know, I could not, I couldn't do it. You go underwater in a, in a, in, in fundamentally a metal, you know, can, 
and and you don't come up for four yeah. months. You don't have any. You don't have any phone. Wow. You don't have any communication with the outside world. You don't know where you are. And then you talk about being resilient or being a resilient BDR and picking up the phone and taking a knock and just keeping going. Like four months underwater for me is like the worst nightmare, right? So he d- develops yeah. calluses, you know, the, this resilience just from that specific role. And I think that translates across mm. the whole of the military. People, people have had so many different experiences that have built them up as a person to make them a really good professional when mm. they get out. So, I, you know, I've thrown a few out there, but yeah at a high level yes sir and indeed i love that thank you so much um and like from rico uh you then worked for descartes systems group as well and you know looking at your linkedin this was like your first look at a role in sas so i'd love to know from somebody that was ex-military you know you went to that friend's party you met this person that got you your first bite and taste into sales you fully found that this was your knack and you was able to hit your target and everything and then all of a sudden you're thrown into this new tank, let's call it for that for the reason, uh, of SAS. What was going through your mind then and what did it mean to you back then? And did it make sense or like was it still like scrambling your brain? How, how, how did you find it? Yeah. I mean, if, if we just take a step back slightly, like Rico as, mm. as an organization, it, I couldn't have had a better stomping like learning ground, cutting my teeth. Like that was you know, hardcore knocking on doors. We used to sell to governments where, you know, tight purse strings, you know, difficult to sell to. It was a commodity sell. We were selling photocopiers and Frankie machines and little bits of software, but nothing too, n- nothing too heavy. But that, uh, mm. f- for me, like understanding the blitz days, we need to make a hundred calls, going and, you know, turning up at a reception and, and trying to have a conversation with the, the receptionist to speak to a business manager that that for me was some of the most important learning i've had you know my entire career to to then give me that step up to get into a software role and i think that's really important to mention and i talk to service leavers all the time about it you know get i it's too many people trying to jump to account executive i I understand why because you get you get some good money but you know you've got to give yourself some time as an sdr bdr and get stuck in and do your numbers and build up that work ethic and learn how to take a knock. Um, so yeah. I just wanted to make sure that, you know, I mentioned that Rico experience cause it was amazing for me. I love that. I love that. And you're right. You know, um, like, how do I put it? It's, you know, learning the ropes, learning the gears and going through the different, uh, parts of a sales process. Because again, similarly, you're like, when I wanted to jump into sales, I wanted to go straight into a closing role to earn commission, travel, see the world and all of that. But, Obviously, taking that SDR route or a telesales rep when I first did it was learning how to have a conversation over the phone and try to convince somebody to have a business conversation with my company. And then, you know, going to events and meeting people face to face and then, you know, sharing information, trying to find out stakeholders, building up my CRM, learning an operating rhythm, you know, learning the, the flow of how this works before I kind of went up to that next step of actually getting into deals and closing on it. And you're, you're very right. It's always good to have that foundational start to learn all those things, ask those questions, make those mistakes, because then that's what's going to set you up for success when you finally transition into that. And coming to yourself where, you know, you had that element of cutting your teeth at Rico and then moving into Descartes Systems, what was that journey like for you, Ben? Yeah, it's interesting because if I look back now, you know, I was wet, wet behind the ears. I, I, I didn't have a clue, really, thinking about it. Um, you know, it was to, into a Canadian company. I'd never worked with, with people outside of the UK in, in the sales world, obviously in the military world. Um, mm. So I was dealing with, you know, people in the US, people in Canada. I was experiencing, you know, the fast pace with you know a quick transition into a, a role where i had quite a bit of responsibility and i just had to figure things mm. out and and I, now i think now it gives me that context where i think you know i i asked the question when we're working with companies what's the training and onboarding like right like how are you ramping these people up because it, i i was comfortable doing it because i've been in the military where you just go you know you, you get you're in an uncomfortable situation you get stuck in and you get it you get it done but for me, getting into that mm-hmm. into SaaS, that first six months, six nine months, it was it was tough. Like it was tough to to figure mm-hmm. things out. I found I did find it challenging. But I, I, again, I genuinely think that the level, that, especially in SaaS in, in technology, 
the you the learning you go through in a nine month period is is outrageous right if you if you go with the pace and you <laughs> get stuck in um so i'd say it was tough it's hard work but i enjoyed it yeah. and i enjoyed the challenge and it, and it paid off right it, it paid off with the work i love it and you're right you know like um Again, going back to my own days of when I was onboarding and working with a startup, it was very fast paced. It wasn't what I was used to, like in the corporate world that I'd experienced before. And like training, you're doing this, you're having meetings with these people, you're talking to counterparts in different countries, and they're talking about the company revenue and growth and what's your pipeline and all of this. There was many a point where I just had to like hold my head and think like, can I do this? You know, this is really scary and it's like really overwhelming. And I know with a lot of our guests that we've had on the show, those first couple of months of onboarding can be quite nerve wracking. And as you said, like you're somebody that's been in situations where you have to kind of crack on, get on with it and you learn as you go along. But like, what sort of tips would you give to somebody that may be listening into this show and thinking, right, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm on this journey right now, Ben, and things are looking really scary. What advice would you give to them? Ask people, just have the courage to ask people in your team. I was speaking with, you know, uh, a service leaver earlier today who been been around every business development manager in the in the company and asked for 30 minutes of the time to talk about you know what they do mm. at the start of the day what, they, what how they structure the days what are the key actions that they take each day so you, you're going to have people within your team you're not generally you're not going to be on your own unless you're a, a really small startup so t just take the opportunity to ask people and just understand what they do because i think because it's so fast paced and you can't always guarantee that the onboarding you know, a, a company is going to be fantastic. You, you may get, if you don't ask, you may get left, left behind a little bit in terms of people forgetting to give you a bit yeah. of information. So I, I'd take you on, a, yeah. take you on initiative, go and ask people. Um, and that's something I've learned over time. It's, it's okay just to, you know, send a message, pick up, pick up a phone and just ask the question. 100%. Like, um, as I've said on the show before, uh, asking for help is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of vulnerability and strength. You know, asking those questions that may seem a bit odd and there's no such thing as a stupid question. It's only silly if you don't ask it, right? Because, you know, you could sit there and just try to wing it and then, you know, they'll realize that things are falling apart from the seams. So yeah, definitely asking those questions. And again, sometimes I think for a lot of SDRs, they may be fearful of looking stupid or not getting it like everybody else is. And with me, if I don't get something, I would just say, look, I'm the idiot in the room. I really just don't understand this. Please explain it to me. And there's nothing wrong in that. And then, you know, you're able to then learn from it as well. So, I, you know, I think Neil, entering I think that Neil, world. Oh, sorry, sorry. I think, I think the, go, the point there though is, the point is don't ask twice. Don't ask the same question twice. Learn from, I think that's the frustrating thing, thing for me when somebody's asking the same question three, four times, right? Like. Never be afraid to ask. Don't don't be don't be too proud to feel to feel st stupid. You know you're not stupid. I st I'm, I'm you know I'm found, founder of a business now, head of sales, senior AE. I always ask questions, always mm. because you know you can't know everything. You just can't. So yeah, but learn, but learn, and, from and it that. learn from it. Hundred percent, and it, it it goes back to that point of you know the traits that get thrown in the industry. Of stay curious. That is curiosity, asking those questions, and it should be like an innate part of being a salesperson because we're here to ask questions to then find out what's going on in people's worlds and how things work, and figure out if we can help with it as well. So um, you then uh, mentioned that there was um, an element of uh, an acquisition with Descartes with PeopleVox, and you transitioned into that role. And you're an account executive, so you're somebody that was closing deals, and you're a senior account man, senior account executive for Europe. What did it feel like getting into a closing role, Ben? And what was that transition like from you know SDRing, business developing, to actually then closing deals? What was that like for you? Yeah, so I mean, originally I was kind of like SDRing in account management, so I got the opportunity to learn about relationship building, to learn to understand how to manage accounts and how to you know upsell or cross sell within accounts whilst having new business targets with no SDRs to support me. So I got a mix of both. I moved into a, an account executive role and I then learned the mix of, we had some, you know, small to medium sized deals and I, and I got the opportunity to work on one large, large deal with, uh, with FedEx and, okay. uh, you know, it was a 12 month 
deal. And the the learning for me when I got into these closing roles is actually where I saw myself fitting in into sales. You, everyone drive. I know everyone mm. drives towards enterprise. For me personally, enterprise is not my gig. Uh, I didn't enjoy it. I, I like the mm. what I learned is I like the. I don't like instant gratification, super transactional, but I like the you know multiple opportunities running over a two to three month sales cycle. That's where I I found yeah. my niche. And I think this, the clause inside of it, I didn't know the difference really between SME, mid market and enterprise at the time and getting mm -hmm. stuck into it, it really brought out that, but my personality doesn't fit with this longer game, you know, 12 month, 24 month sales cycle. I actually didn't enjoy closing that deal when we closed it. I just felt relief. Mm. I, got, I got a good, pay, I got a good After all that time. Yeah. I mean, four months of legal <laughs> negotiation, right? Like for, it was just Jeez. relief. It was, I got a good paycheck, but I felt like the the enjoyment and the excitement was a little bit lost on me with that deal. So from a closing perspective, that's, that specific period really helped niche me out of where I wanted to work. And it's a good point that you raise this as well, because um, you're not the first person to say that they don't enjoy enterprise sales. We've had guests that do in enjoy the enterprise sales side of it as well. Um, and similarly with myself, uh, enterprise for me as an SDR was cool to go after if I could book a meeting with a big logo and a big business. But then when I went into the world of an account executive and closing and running an enterprise sales cycle, bloody hell, it was a minefield. It was like through legal procurement, you're having multiple meetings over the course of a year. And it's trying to convince different business units to then align with an overall consensus decision of the business. And it's like you're going through multiple sales cycle over the course of the year. But I think what would be interesting from your point of view, because again, we may be having people listening to this uh, podcast and watching this vidcast from our world that are already in the SDR role, but we may be having some service leavers that are listening into this, right? How would you explain to them what the difference is between running a small to medium sized deal, mid market deal and enterprise? What's that world like? And how would you simplify it to them as to what it is? Yeah, really, let's really simplify it. Imagine you need to get to, you know, a decision maker, somebody who's going to sign your contract. Now in small, small to medium, that could be one or two people, right? Could be, could mm -hmm. be one person. You could be speaking to the founder of a fashion brand. Then you go and yeah. sell to Chanel and you are then speaking to maybe 50 people in a chain and you need to figure out how to get from one to two to three, you know, back yeah. to two across to seven and then all the way up to 50 it takes a long time it takes a lot of effort you know a mm. lot of things can go wrong it's much higher risk you know you maybe have three or four opportunities you might have two or three opportunities on the go at any one point so one of them drops off mm. it's a lot of your pipeline gone a lot of your target gone yeah where yeah. you know it's i guess less risk and more i guess pace is the way that I would mm. explain the small to medium size. And, and there's a big gap between transactional small to medium as well, right? We, yeah. it, it, we say small to medium, but you know, there's a difference between selling to a 5 million pound fashion brand and a 50 million pound and a hundred million pound and a 200 million. Like there is a big, there's a big, there's little tranches between the big tranche, right? Um, so yeah, that's probably the best way to simplify it. Get decision makers, lots of them. 100% agree and eloquently put as well, Ben. Uh, and I think it was really good for you like to then realize what you actually enjoyed, you know, like running a couple of months, like a two to three month sales cycle where, you know, you do an initial bit of hunting, you're finding out their requirements, you're doing an element of a sales cycle, presenting solutions and then closing that deal on and then moving on to the next project or deal. Right. Um, and I had to go this through a couple of times because my pride and ego got in the way a lot of the time where I thought, right, I'm an account executive now, I can close business. And then when you're having a catch up with your VP and said, okay, so what's going on with this big deal? And I'm like, I don't know, chief. <laughs> I don't know. And uh, I'm trying everything I can. And, you know, I keep getting hit this and said, well, you know, and then this is kind of where I, I, I had to understood there were different sales methodologies out there as well. So, you know, like I could do spin, like situation pain, impact, uh, implied need uh, for a mid-market SMB deal. But then when I went into the big dog deals, like you'd have methodologies such as medic, right? 
where you're looking for the economic buyer, you're looking for the decision process, you're looking for impact, you're looking for all these sort of things. And it, it, I loved learning about it, but I realized there were things that I could apply myself to and do well. And there were other things that just wasn't really my bag. And, you know, having to hand over those deals to either the VP or another account executive that was suited to it. And I kind of, you know, this is like where you figure out what you like and what you don't like. So with me, loved having conversations with companies that were growing, that were on to plans and stuff like that, but they weren't completely defined versus a very big corporate company that had red tape all over it. And it was very hard to convince and push a new initiative through. I was just like, nah, I don't want to do it anymore. Um, but with yourself, coming back to yourself, uh, after Descartes, uh, you then moved into Supply Compass, where you donned the title of Head of Sales. So you've gone through the SDR role, you've done account management, you've gone into closing, and now you're leading a team, dude. Like, how did that feel? Yes. Yeah, so, so, I mean, we're, it was a very small start, right? So Supply Compass was in the similar space to PeopleVox. So PeopleVox... Mm. And this is where I start to niche, niche out, right? I really enjoyed selling to e-commerce brands. So brands, again, fashion, fashion was uh, quite a big area. Uh, fashion brands that are in the e-commerce space specifically, so not really, they don't really sell retail B2B wholesale. Um, so the transition into supply compass, I was doing a lot of selling as well, right? We were a startup, we were competing against some, you know, mammoths in the industry and in, in the, in the kind of category we were in. So mm. although, you know, we were, out, we were looking at the sales process and starting to define ICP, de define the types of buying perso personas, looking at our positioning, it was just for me, a deeper dive into the structure of the revenue organization and the go to market. That was the, the biggest takeaway mm. from, from, for that experience w was that like the difference between going into a startup versus even going into a rel relatively established 50 person, 100 person company with a defined sales process, just again, mm. way different, right? And they, and I think it's something that we should talk up to SDRs or people coming into the industry about because the experience of going into startup, start startup early, early days versus going mm. into even 20 to 30, then 50 person companies, it, it's just, way different and and that was the biggest takeaway for me I, and i loved it experience learning wise that was that was just crazy the amount of time on board <laughs> in that space of time and you're very right like um it's a point that i bring up with SEOs. like when i join different projects of startups that i've done in the last 10 years or so i'm like um there's three ways that i categorize startups so there's the initial startup where it's like a couple of people through the like the first 10 50 people right um, and then when you get to like, you know, 150 to 200 employees, that's what I call a scale up. So that's when they've normally secured funding. They've definitely got a, a market fit and they're looking for that next level of growth because they want to be a big dog one day. And that may last for a couple of years of being a scale up. Um, and then the next stage uh, is where they go through another couple of rounds of funding. They've got maybe 500 plus employees. They've got global offices all around the world. And they're looking to maybe run that rate of becoming a public company one day. And that's when they start becoming enterprise ready. And what I've done is I've experienced all those three companies and I've realized it's the startup space that I'm really passionate about when mm. it's first early doors, first people on the ground, you're defining stuff and nothing makes sense yet. And you're like, you're experimenting and you have, you know, the experience to be able to do that uh, along with the pay as well. Uh, and then when it gets into scale up mode, I enjoy it. Um, because, you know, things have been defined, things are now gearing up, it's getting a bit more serious, but it still has that fluidity of feeling like a startup, like we've got a vision, we've got a mission, we're having fun, we're doing this. And then when it gets into, you know, enterprise ready, it's at that point that I'm not as interested because, you know, they want to become a public company. It feels a bit more corporate. There's a lot more red tape going on. There's a lot more structured processes and, you know, the pay may not be as great as it once was. Um, but for me personally, it's startup and scale up. That's the space that I love thriving in. Uh, what about yourself? Like what, what, what floats your boat? Is it the, the beginning of a company that you really like or like when it's a little bit late down the line? It's such a good question. Cause ne I never really thought about it, but you, you explaining it then, you know, if hmm. I was going to go and sell, I, so I'm at, what am I going into become an AE? I'm going somewhere to AE. Yeah. Hmm. I, I would now, if I was, you know, we, drop redeployable tomorrow and I went to sell, I yeah. would go to scale up. I'd go to one to 200 person. 
defined sales process, defined ICP, proved, you know, proven the model and it's getting there and just go and sell. Like I think, I think I get the most enjoyment out of, I got, if we're talking about learning experience, startup hands yeah. down, you, you cannot, yeah. you cannot, and I'm talking across, across the revenue organization and how you work with marketing and how you work with customer success and how you, you know, just work with a CEO and leadership team. But actually, if we're talking from a pure sales perspective, Ben, the AE, mm. if I want to really yeah. refine my selling skills, I'd go to scale up one to 200, define process, get me in there, yeah. give me my boundaries, you know, let, let me go and sell. I love it. I love it. And funny enough, that was a stage in my career. That's when I met Max, um, because nice. I'd worked at a startup before. And then when we started becoming scale up, uh, the story goes with Max was um, our VP of sales. We we're looking to hire a bunch of uh, UK account executives was at that level of growth. Um, and then uh, this young guy who I'd been talking to on LinkedIn for a while was a recruiter. And I was giving him tips about how to get into tech sales because he wanted to do that route. And then he advised he was ex-military. Uh, and then one day I turn up into the office in London in Moorgate, and then there's this young chap who's all dressed with a shirt and tie on with a, like his hair brush and everything. It looked really good. And I walk in and I sit down and I was like, I know you from somewhere. He was like, you're the guy that's been helping me on LinkedIn. Here I am. And I was like, Max, <laughs> lovely to meet you. And then, you know, the rest is history. Um, but with yourself, like, um, you know, choosing to work in that company, a startup, you know, you then took the decision to start running your own business. And before we dive into what re redeployable do and how you help people, etc., like what was the thinking about? What was the gap that you saw that started that thought process off of, you know, launching your own business, Ben? Yeah. Yeah. Looking back. So what I would say is I, I, I had the idea for two years prior, mm. um, but I didn't think my story was defined enough to go and do it. I didn't think I had the confidence in that, in that, two year prior, I felt like I needed to do more in the industry. I needed, you know, I've, mm. got, I've been very lucky in the fact that I've, I've, I've always hit my target throughout my, throughout my sales career, but I just felt like I needed to develop my story in, in the tech space before I went and did anything like that. Um, going into a startup and working with two, two co-founders was inspiring mm. for me, it made me feel like, you know, I was, you know, directly re reporting into the CEO. Uh, and the head of product who was the other co-founder to just getting into that startup environment and seeing, you know, just the passion, the drive, the determination to, and the belief in what they were doing. Just, I, f I felt like I'd got to the point where I was like, that, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm ready to go and do this. Uh, my confidence is, is high enough. I, I believe in what I want to go and do. Um, so that mm. was the, the catalyst really. I mean, the back to your question that. on what, what it was that I saw, well, from a military perspective, you know, me leaving the military, the only reason I got into tech sales is because my brother told me about it. That, mm. that and, and that's it. I was just lucky that I had a brother who was in tech sales and you've got a, you know, 15,000 service leavers a year coming out in the UK, 250,000 a year coming out in the US. So it's a, it's a bloody lot of people. And the status quo route is go and be a project manager, you know, get into mm -hmm. so, so the offices, get into wealth management, um, operations, all of these status quo routes, they're all pushed down these routes. Like this is what you should do because it's what's been done before. And I was like, why mm -hmm. are people not getting, you know, getting the opportunity to get into this industry where frankly, and I, I don't talk about this as outwardly, but frankly, you talk about money. I talk about six figures to people like there's a route to six figures, but yeah. actually it's, it's even more than that. You know, it's, I'm talking your high six figures. If you're very good at it, you, mm. the opportunity to earn and gain some financial freedom in this industry is unprecedented. And that's what I'm trying to create for people I'm trying to create this tr pathway, this transition to an industry that I've fully enjoyed for five years. Um, so that's why mm. I did it. I love that. And it's, it's good to hear like the passion behind it. And like you said, you had that older brother that told you to get into tech sales. So you had, you know, um, a doorway, which was open for you by a family member and you went and you opened that door and you explored it and you had the time of your life. And then from, if I understand correctly, you know, for people that are leaving the service, there are narratives or status quo jobs that they're kind of advised to go into because 
they maybe thought as that's where you're going to best fit into. But what you're kind of saying is, well, actually, no, guys and girls, there's a completely different world out there that you've not tapped yet. And there is a high earning potential in there. If you know, you can get into this and you can become very well, you become, you know, financially free. And I think that is a narrative for a lot of us that what we want in life is, you know, we want purpose. We want to have a direction. We want to help build something we want to grow, but we also want that element of financial freedom. So coming to your business of redeployable, let's imagine for a minute for our listeners and watchers and people that are listening in the show, imagine for a moment, ladies and gents, Neil has worked in the service of the military and I've been in there for quite a while. You know, the pandemic has changed mindsets of, you know, where am I going to be in the future? What am I going to be doing? Maybe this isn't something I want to continue. I then come across redeployable. What are you trying to do to help a guy like me, Ben? Yeah. Uh, again, great question. So I, let's think about my brother. Let's think about what he did. So I got into technology sales and I had support, right? I had a shit. What does that mean? Mm. I, I hope I can swear. I no, no, go for it, dude. Cool. cool. No hell's uh, you know, <laughs> shit. What does that mean? Yeah. You know, Gareth, can you, can you give us, give us a point around this? So I had all, all the way through my career, somebody to turn to. So that's, one thing that's always been really, really high, a high priority for me for he when we're helping people. But, you know, you come to us, Neil, what we do initially is ask you to complete a form. The form is has some long form questions. It's only a short form, some long form questions just to look at how you articulate on paper, you know, how you answer the questions, what kind of person you are. Do you answer all the questions? Do you do mm -hmm. what we ask you to do on the form? Then we get you in for an interview and we start to talk about y your drivers. You know, we... I want to understand what you're looking to get out of your next career, because quite frankly, you know, there could be people in the military that are a good fit, but just not what they're looking for in the career isn't the right fit for te the technology yeah. industry. But also there are people that just aren't a good fit and it doesn't mean they're bad people, they're bad professionals to just, you know, I've, I've tried to learn how to code in the past. Let's use that as an example. Mm. I can't, I'm not going to be able to code. Like I'm not, I'm not wired in that way to be able to, to code and be, be a, you know, a software engineer. It, it does, I don't think it makes me a bad yeah. professional. I'm just not a fit. So we look at that and, and we start to analyze whether we think they are. And then what we do then is once we think they are, we then help them to transition. So we have a community uh, called the Redeployable Community. We have training courses in there. We're doing a lot next year around um, like a, a kind of career development. So longer courses, you know, taking them from standing to start through to actual job uh, mm -hmm. and then continued support. We also have a mentorship program. So once we, you know, once we help you find a job, we'll also get you a mentor. A veteran generally in technology sales, there, there are a lot, you'll be surprised, but it, it, that's not essential. Somebody who is experienced in the industry that can be that guide. So what I'm trying to do is create this pathway where we support them all the way from start to community, to interview prep, to coaching through the interview process to job, and then continue to support them because, you know, what I really want is people ramping quickly. I want people mm. promoting quickly. And we want to tell us stories about these people and how well they're doing in the industry because I think it'll encourage more people to, you know, look into the military community to hire. I think that's admirable, sir. So if I get it right, and just to kind of clarify, so if I was in the service and I'm looking to leave, I would come to redeployable and one of the points and pillars that you give me is in terms of support so you're that go-to person if i don't understand what the hell this tech jargon means you can help simplify it and explain it to me you'll have a meeting with me to understand okay like what's my strengths weaknesses am i a good fit for coming into tech sales and give me some advice upon that and if it's not a good fit you'll be very upfront about it You'll help me with the recruitment side of like finding that tech job to get me into. You provide training, uh, which could be sales training and coaching, etc. And then obviously once I'm placed in that job, you then still provide me that mentorship and that buddy system through a community and through yourselves whilst I've got that job. Is that right, Ben? That's yeah, exactly right. And it, and I didn't even talk about really the education piece because unfortunately when you talk Please about do. sales, people naturally get like a, a twinge oh i don't want to be a salesperson An because ick. they don't understand <laughs> they don't understand it they don't yeah. they've experienced you know you, they may have experienced a few good sales people but they probably experienced some bad sales people from a you know direct to consumer b to c perspective so they actually don't a lot of them yeah. understand initially what b to b sales is all about so yeah definitely our job to educate people on the industry um 
to give to give them a heads up about you know what it's all about. The big thing I would always uh, encourage though, or at least mention, is that we would never encourage people to leave the forces. It's a big one for me, um, mm. just because I, I you know every it's time when you're in the military, your time is your time. You know when it's coming up yourself. Some people are 22 years yeah. people. Some people are 30 year people. So we're not really in the game of encourage, encouraging people to sign off. But when they've made that decision, mm. that's when we come in. Got you. I love that. And I was also like uh, a thought that's been itching in the back of my head uh, since we started the show is obviously uh, where you said at the beginning of following your sister and following your brother into a mili military career and then giving the advice of, you know, get into tech sales. Now that you're doing this thing, like for the past four years of working in it and, you know, doing it and now helping other people get into it, what, what what's the conversations like at dinner and like talking about tech and all of that? How, how do those conversations go now, Ben? Yeah, so, um, I mean, my, my brother and I talk about selling all the time. My brother, my bro he'll, he'll call me up and we'll talk about it and I'll, we'll have conversations about what we're doing redeployable. It's, it's an, e it's an easy conversation to start, right, with both of us. My sister's actually transitioning out. So my sister's the first ever female Royal Engineering uh, Regimental Sergeant Major in 350 years. So she, wow. you know, she's been, a, she been a, a massively high performer in the military. So she's now speaking with the likes of your sales forces, your Microsofts. Mm. She's transitioning. She, she'll be moving into civilian life in September next year. So wow. we'll probably start to have conversations with her about her, you know, tech career when she gets out too. But we don't we don't sit around, <laughs> you know, having dinner together. Unfortunately, my brother's in Burnley, my sister's in in the military, still travelling. So, but yeah, when we mm. do when we do catch up, we we do talk about it. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, there. And again, for our guests, listeners, and watchers, um, I'm going to supply all the links if you want to find out more about Ben and Redeployable and the services they offer as well. Um, so please make sure you check out and feel free to reach out to Ben if you have any questions as well. And hope that's all right with you, Ben. Of course, of course. And we will have our beautiful new website in four weeks, which, which, which is another one of these learning things for me, <laughs> <laughs> website <laughs> development. You know, and, and, and this is a point that, um, I wanted to ask your thoughts on as well, because we've kind I think when we, we met a few weeks ago and you was telling me your story and I gave you my visual story of, you know, building a thing and launching your own business, because a lot of our listeners as well, they may want to go into this route of running their own business. And I think it's really cool when I, I agree with your point of, you know, you working in the trenches, working in these companies, working with these co-founders, seeing these sales processes and learning all the blueprints of how other people are doing it to then take the leap to do it yourself. And like you said, this was like a brainchild of two years, but you thought you hadn't got enough knowledge or information yet to do it yourself. But I wanted to ask you the honest question of, okay, doing this gig for seven months and running your own company, what's it like being a founder and actually doing it? You're no longer the sheep, sir. You're the shepherd and you're leading the way, right? What, what does it feel like to go? What is that experience like? And what advice yeah. would you give to somebody that's maybe contemplating as well? I'm actually doing a link, a LinkedIn post tomorrow about the negatives of it. Right. Cause I like, yeah. I love it. I, I love, I love it. Best, best professional decision I've ever made. Most difficult, mm. but the best. Um, what's it like to be the founder? Well, I mean, if we look at what I'm posting about tomorrow, you can't switch off. You're constantly thinking about it. Mm. I wake up in the morning and think about it alongside my, my, my son. Um, but you know, it, mm. it's always on your mind. You, you put in, I know there's this, the culture around like the no hustle culture anymore. And you thinking about the time you put, you put some long hours in because you know, it, it's the future financial future for your family, right? It's, it's what you've invested mm. yourself in. Um, you constantly hit hurdles of, you don't know, you know, running the business operationally, like payroll, just hired our first person, you know, admin. Uh, mm -hmm. tax yeah tax should i be on that you know <laughs> how should i limit should i be limited uh, uh, all these things yeah. but what i would say is if you want the freedom and the satisfaction of doing something you know that is your own then i i i like i talk about all the negatives the positives are i am my own, i am master of my own destiny you know i am the master of my mm -hmm. own destiny i get up in the morning and i plan my own day you know, I, I'm going to hit challenges 
I really like a lot of stoicism. You know, I've I have done for probably the last yeah. four years. Just like I just I just try and and I fall foul to it. You know, letting it overwhelm me. But actually, if you start to compartmentalize things and you just take it as it is and control what you can control, you know, it it, it is a great decision. And selling, learning to sell. I can't think yeah. of a better trade to then go into this, you know, having your own business and selling ideas with nothing, no website, no, no collateral and going to, you know, getting into a billion pound company and trying to convince them that this is a really good idea. I can't think of a better, a yeah. better trade. <laughs> it's, it's a wicked, it's a wicked journey as well. And you're right, because I was having this conversation because I think a few months ago I was speaking to somebody where I was talking about, you know, I run my own business and been doing it for about four and a half years. Uh, and then one day they were asking me, oh, what are you up to today? And I said, oh, I've taken the day off because um, I just need some time to chill. And they're like, oh, it's lucky for some. And I looked at them with a bit of disdain. I was like, what do you mean lucky for some? They said, oh, well, I wish I could just take the day off if I wanted to. And I was like, but do you know how long and hard I've had to work in order to have the power? Because if I don't work, I don't get paid that day. And obviously I feel I've been working six months without a holiday and, you know, I still sometimes work on weekends when my kids here, I don't work, everything gets shut off. You know, I know how to detach from that, but it's scary. Cause like you said, like when you wake up in the morning, right, what do I need to do today? What calls do I need to do? What do I need to chase up on invoices? And you know, like when you're learning the world of accounting for the first time of a limited company, what does that mean? And how much tax do I have to do? And what's corporation tax? And then when you're hiring people and you're supposed to put contracts together, you're then speaking to a legal advisor of, is this compliant? Is this with IR35? Are they an employee or, free? you know, all of this sort of stuff. Um, so, and, and once somebody said to me like, oh, you've got an easy life uh, and you have minimal responsibilities. I was like, dude, running a company is somebody that has a lot of responsibilities because it's on your own two shoulders, right? And if it all goes to pot, that's on you. You can't blame anybody else, right? It is very tough. It is very scary. And I would admit to, to, to our listeners as much as it's not for everyone. But for those that do want to do it and you're happy to learn and go through the trenches and grind, it's one hell of a journey, Ben. It's freaking, it's, it, it's what wakes you up in the morning, right? And it, it, it keeps you going. It's a lot of fun, but it's tough. But oh. I think if everything was easy, then everybody would be doing it, right? Tougher than selling, I think. <laughs> you know, I, I quite happily yeah, go and be an Indeed. Yeah, 100%. Like, you know, even like funding, right? Like, you got paid. You got. Mm. You just said you got to pay yourself. You know, I was lucky that I was successful yeah. in a sales career to give me the again back to financial freedom to give me the financial freedom to then say, okay, it's gonna because I'm I don't take any money out of the business right now. I'm investing back into the business, so we're burning savings, right? Yeah. My wife's my wife's just had yeah. a baby. Like the, there's risk, it's risk and pressure. So you do. I think you do have to be. I think you do have to be open-minded and the right type of person to go about it. But yeah, it's, um, it's, it is, it is an interesting journey and, and one that I just, I'm so thankful that I, I, I committed to. Definitely. Well, me, me and you, Ben, we're going to definitely stay in touch because again, if I went four and a half years ago, just launching company, just had a baby, had no website, had no leads, had no curriculum. And I just had this idea of what SDR training should be about. Four and a half, five years later, it'll be five years next month. I'm still here. So again, if you ever need somebody to pick somebody's brain and I'm going to be learning from you and hopefully our listeners and watchers will be able to learn from you as well. And obviously you're helping, you know, ex service leaders come into this beautiful industry and learn from them and have a great guy helping them out on the journey. It's freaking amazing. But, um, you know, we could talk for hours about this cause I, I love this stuff, but coming to the end of our show, uh, I guess a question, that I, a pertinent question that I love to ask all of our guests is if it could go back way in time to that young Ben who didn't really know what he wanted to do. What three bits of advice, but he's about to embark on this journey. What three bits of advice would you give to that young Ben? Yeah, I see a lot of things, uh, on LinkedIn about, you know, in your twenties, you should be getting up at 5am and, you know, going sauna and cold showers and, you know, meditating. I I'd say just do what number one, just continue to do what I did, you know, the, you don't join the military because you know, you're going to be really super wealthy at the end of it. You join the military for an experience. Mm. You know, my lifelong friends just hired one into the business, ex military, right? They're all, they'll be my lifelong friends. They, they, they really will be. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change my path way at all. I think what I did was right for that time of my life. Um, 
But I'd, I'd probably, if I if I looked back, I'd probably take more responsibility around like self learning. Something I I've really mm. knuckled down on in the last say six years uh, is you know reading podcasts, just trying to just consume knowledge, things that interest me, and that's something I probably didn't do enough. You know, from from eighteen through to twenty seven, didn't do enough of it. Um, mm. So. I'd say do do some more self learning. Don't change the path. Like I don't regret anything I've done. I met my wife because I joined the army. I've got a baby because I've got joined the army. Um, I'm the mm. I'm the character I am because I joined the army. Um, mm. So yeah, so I, I think that's two right. Don't. Yep. I I I don't I don't believe in this. Uh, you need to. Some people it's right to take control of the twenties and go and push on professionally like that and go and do your cold showers and bloody saunas and everything around that. But actually I viewed twenties for me as going out and enjoying myself in my twenties before I had the responsibilities mm -hmm. of a family, you know, starting to build those yeah. friendships, you know, getting myself ready for, I call it your pro thirties, you know, my professional thirties mm -hmm. were, that's where it's at. Right. That's my thirties and my, my, yeah. it's going to be my greatest decade. I think I'm hoping. There'll be many more great decades to come, Ben. I can assure you that. So I've got, I've got a, I've got a bit on it that you're going to have some more years to come on that as well. But you know, great bits of advice like do what's right for you, take ownership of your personal development and learning, and yeah, ultimately like enjoy before stuff gets too serious. Because when <laughs> shit gets serious, it does get serious and it gets boring, and we we lose that child-like uh, mentality. And one thing I'd say as a dad to another dad like focus on how your child has fun and how they see the world because if you can see it through their eyes things can be a hell of a lot more fun and less stressful like when i look at happy selling and business and their playful elements to it my son who sometimes sits on this microphone and chair when you know i'm not online and he pretends to be daddy after watching youtube videos i'm like yeah do you know what he's got it he's got that spark and smile that's what i try to bring into all my sessions uh it's, but ben, it's, so, it's neil it's so funny because i found the other day Behind me. This is weird, right? But I I had a zombie goblet that in my early twenties <laughs> I used to drink wine out of a zombie goblet. I don't know why we used to do it. A couple <laughs> of us. And I found it in a in a drawer the other day and I was like that I I'll now put it out because I think, you know, yeah. I, I'm mega serious and I've got a kid and I'm trying to run a business. But actually, you know, it went it went ten years ago that I was drinking wine out of a zombie goblet, so <laughs> Cheers to that, mate. I Cheers freaking love that. that. That's a cool story. Uh, and are there any shout outs or kudos that you'd like to give out on today's show, Ben? No, well, yes, Max, obviously, for putting us in touch with each other. All of the people in the military who have, who have the courage, you know, to go and, and do something completely different when they get out, you know, and they're all smashing it, the people that we've worked with so far. And, you know, absolutely all of the people that have helped me along the way, because I have not done anything i've done in my career without the help of many 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 people so they all know who they are love it it takes uh was it a team to, to build a village right yeah exactly 100 percent. well ben uh, a complete salute to you to max to all the guys and girls out there as well and a massive shout out to all of our listeners watchers and subscribers and as a gentle reminder if you're listening to this in your local podcast platform, please give us a rate and a subscribe. And if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, please make sure you like, comment and subscribe down below. And as mentioned, I'm going to be putting all of Ben's links and redeployable in the show notes so you can check it out and you can reach out. But Mr. Ben Reed, thank you so much for joining on today's show. I wish you a successful week. Uh, I know I'm going to see a lot of you in the future, sir. And most importantly, happy selling. Thanks very much for having me, Neil.